Please open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. We'll remain standing for the reading of God's word. Galatians chapter 2. We will read for the sake of context from verses 11 through 21. The word of God says, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I, which I now live, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through faith, comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. You may be seated. Open prayer. Father, we thank you for your holy word. Thank you for the opportunity, God, that you have granted me as your humble servant to come open the scriptures to your people. I pray, Father, that as we look through this great doctrine of justification by faith, that you would illumine the scriptures to us, that you would make the clear teaching of the word portrayed to your people this afternoon, Father. We pray that Christ will be glorified in the teaching of the gospel and that rebel sinners would be purchased by the redemption that we have in Christ. I pray that you would bless our time and bless this preaching in Christ's name. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters. So my task is Galatians 2.20, but... If you know anything about teaching the Bible, the first and most important three rules of exegesis is context, context, context. So I want to give you the context, and then we are going to get very focused in verses 19 and 20. So by way of giving us the context, I want to first start overall the book of Galatians. So the book of Galatians is actually not written to a specific church, but rather a group of churches in the region of Galatia. And Galatia is north of Jerusalem. So Paul writes this letter to a group of churches, and unlike the rest of his other letters that Paul writes to churches, he doesn't have much to be thankful to them for. He doesn't thank God for anything that they have done in their church or in the churches. Rather, he comes out the gate with a gospel and then right away starts striving into the gospel, proclaiming what the true gospel is, So he goes headlong into gospel defense, articulating the gospel, showing the futility of the law to be able to justify someone and the need for Christ to be our only hope of justification. And then as we progress along here, we're going to see when he gets to, when we see this very famous verse here in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. That verse actually comes as a response to Peter Cephas in our text here, also Peter, same person. This apostle walking in a way that wasn't forthright or straightforward with the gospel. So his practice wasn't in line with the gospel, which leads Paul to call him out, to oppose him to his face publicly, and then make these very famous statements, this this short argument that we have here in verses 15 to 21, 
which are kind of, they lay the foundation for how he is going to uh, open up these these various statements, these various theses in the rest of the book of Galatians. And so with that in mind, I want to, as it were, jump off an airplane at 30,000 feet, which is probably too high for skydiving. And I want to survey the context from verses 11 to 14 so we can start understanding what's going on in this context of the church here at Antioch, where, where they are at. And then so we can get into Paul's response to Peter which he said publicly to everyone, and see how what, what Peter was doing, how it was offensive to the gospel. So with that in mind, let me kind of give you the context. The context is we are in the city of Antioch. Antioch is about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. It's off the Mediterranean Sea. It's a very popular and very populated city in the first century. It's actually the, it's a, it's a, it's the capital city of Syria in that region. And it has a large Jewish population. So as we're doing this first uh, set, I want you to put a finger in Acts chapter 10. We're going to go Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 16. We'll be looking at Acts to help us kind of lay the context of what's going on here in Antioch. So now Antioch is a very largely Jewish populated, has, has a large Jewish population. And the reason it has a large Jewish population is because of the persecution that was actually happening in Jerusalem at the time. That's in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 21, it says this. So then, those who, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. But... There were some of them, men of Cyprus, of Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. So we have Antioch. It is, by and large, a Greek city, and a bunch of Jewish, Jewish Christians flee because of the persecution due to Stephen when Saul led the, held the, the stoning of Stephen outside the gates. Now, all these Christians, they go up there and they preach the gospel because wherever Christians go, they preach the gospel. The good news comes with them. So they go preach the gospel up there in Antioch and God shows favor. And there's a lot who believe, a lot of Greeks who believe. And so what happens is they start mixing. They start enjoying fellowship together because that's what God does in the gospel. He unites us to himself and to one another. So it's very interesting about what's going on in Antioch is that Antioch has a large Greek population with a large Christian Jewish population. So these would be what we would call today Messianic Jews. And now these Jews, they grew up under the law, under Torah, right? So they grew up knowing that you do not have fellowship with a Greek. You do not eat with them, right? They are unclean. You cannot participate in going to their house and having any kind of fellowship with a non-Jewish person who does not keep Torah because they are unclean and they would make you unclean, thereby defiling your covenant responsibility before God as a person of the nation of Israel. And so what's going on though in Antioch is all that, they just do away with it. They just start enjoying good Christian fellowship as they are supposed to, just like Ephesians chapter two says that, Jesus Christ in the gospel, he tore down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. That dividing wall of hostility, he tore it apart. And now he's made from the two men, one man, one man. So this one bride that is perfectly, that is united in Christ. So this is where we at. That's, that's kind of the lay of the land in, in Antioch. And now Cephas goes to Antioch. So Peter, I'm going to say Peter for the rest of the sermon, just because we're more familiar with the name Peter. So Peter goes to Antioch. And when he goes to Antioch, the Apostle Paul is already there doing ministry with Barnabas. And Barnabas is Paul's missionary partner, right? Barnabas is also a Jew. He is born of the tribe of Levite, as we can see that in Acts chapter 4, kind of gives us his history. He is a Levite. He's also nicknamed the son of encouragement, right? So he is this very helpful and encouraging, godly leader in the early church. They are there. And Paul 
has to go to Peter. This is what he goes to him. He says, I went to him because he stood condemned. And this is not the same kind of, even though it sounds harsh in our language, in English, condemned. But basically what it means is that he was at serious fault. He had made a serious error, a mistake. And because of this, Paul opposes this pillar of the church to his face. And then here's the, here's the, the whole story, what's going on. It says, verse 12, For prior to the coming... Certain, for prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. So they're in Antioch. They're having good Christian fellowship, Jews, Greeks, right? No distinction, as we're going to get in in Galatians chapter 3. There is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Scythian nor barbarian. They're all one in Christ Jesus. So they are living like that in Antioch already. They're enjoying that good Christian fellowship. And then there's some leaders from the church in Jerusalem. And these men, certain men from James, now James, this is the brother, the half-brother of Jesus, who is an elder at the church in Jerusalem. And certain men from him, who are the party of the circumcision, as we get at the end of verse 12, it kind of clarifies who these people are specifically. So these party of the circumcision, these are the people, the Jewish Christians, who say, listen, Unless you are going to be circumcised, you cannot become a Christian. Unless you participate in the ceremonial law, in the cleanliness law, obedience to the law of Torah, you cannot be a Christian. And so this is what the whole entire Jerusalem council was in Acts 15, is hashing through, okay, we have Christian believers who are not Jews, and it's true that they're believers because we have seen the Holy Spirit fall upon them. They have spoken in tongues. The signs of regeneration have been evident in their lives. And so how are we to interact with these people, right? And so these are very important questions that the first century church is dealing with. How do we treat these people who are unclean as far as we knew just 10 years ago before Jesus resurrected from the, from the, from the dead? Like we still were under Torah. And now they are part of God's household. They're the same Holy Spirit indwells them as he indwells us. Now, how are we to relate to one another? So they're hashing out all these things. And then you have the very, I don't want to say conservative, but you have the very legalistic party of the circumcision who says, unless you abide by circumcision, by keeping the law, the food laws, by the Sabbaths, by whatever other laws we have in Leviticus and the whole Torah, you cannot be a Christian. We cannot have fellowship together. And so then, this is what Paul Peter used to do. He used to eat with the Gentiles. And that's a no-no for a good Jewish boy. But he did it because he's a good Christian. And he had fellowship with his brothers and sisters, regardless of nationality or ethnic descent. It was irrelevant. But then here's where the mistake comes. But when these men came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof because he feared the party of the circumcision. So this word here, withdraw, it's a technical word. It actually has military roots. It's a strategic word. He strategically started to withdraw and to back away from fellowship with these Greek believers because they were not Jews out of fear. So it's not like one day to the next, he just separated himself and it was done. But it was very sly. It was manipulative. Because as we say later, that it says that even Barnabas was carried away by the hypocrisy, showing that there was some sort of a progress to this. It didn't just happen overnight. And Barnabas is like, oh, this is what we're doing now? But rather, he's seeing the pattern of their lifestyle, their behavior, as they're slowly starting to depart them, to withdraw and to separate themselves from the Greek Christians. To the point where it says that the rest of the Jews, in verse 13, they joined Peter in his hypocrisy. So Peter, being a leader, being an apostle of the church, the rest of the Jews who were there having good fellowship. And remember, Peter had nothing to do with the founding of the church in Antioch. He comes there and they know who he is and they see his behavior, his pattern of life, and they follow him. They imitate him as their leader, as one who is not just a Christian, but also of their same ethnicity. And so they follow him in his hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas, the son of encouragement, this faithful man of God, who is also a Jew, 
he is carried away by their hypocrisy. And the hypocrisy here is, it's like these people didn't even really believe the reasons why. They were like, we already had good Christian fellowship. There's no point for us to like go back. Why are we going back to the law? And what's, what's going on kind of behind the Greek word here is they are, they're play acting. They're just playing the part to just go along as to not stir up any problems with the Jerusalem church who everyone had great respect for, especially for James as being the half-brother of Jesus Christ. And so that in this way, verse 14, Paul says, he says, but when I saw that they, all these men acting in hypocrisy, were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, there's something so important right there, in the presence of all, not fearing. So this is one of the things you, you got to love about Paul. Paul is not a man to be intimidated by stature. And just like God, a man after God's own heart, he was a man after God's own character and that God is not a respecter of persons. He does not care if you are the apostle, the president, the emperor, the king, or a slave, whoever, right? We're all equal before the throne of God. and We're all equally sinners before God. He opposes him to his face. He opposes him to his face. And it's not with the intention of dividing, but rather over uniting over the truth of the gospel because the gospel is at stake here. This is what's at stake here. It's not just people not eating dinner together. It's about walking in the integrity of the gospel. So the gospel isn't just something that you believe in your mind, in your heart, and you get to live your life however you want. That's not what the gospel does. It affects how you interact with your neighbor now. Now you do it differently because you are a Christian. It's how you work, how you do everything in your life is affected by the truth of the gospel. And like Peter, we can at times stray away from walking in the truth of the gospel. And it is important that we be reminded of the great truth of the gospel that would bring us back to a right walking with the truths that we believe, the truths that we confess. And so this is his first statement in verse 14. This is kind of wrapping up our context here. You being a Jew, you live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. How is it that you are compelling the Gentiles to live like Jews? You're living like the rest of them already. You're already eating with them. You stopped eating kosher. I saw you eating bacon. Like, what are you doing? Now you want them to live like Jews, but they're Greeks. And this doesn't make any sense. What, what are you doing, Peter? And that launches Paul into his whole entire just beautiful gospel declaration of that. But before we get there, there is a, an objection that came to my mind. It's like, wait up, Paul, but didn't you circumcise Timothy? You guys remember that in Acts 16? Acts 16, it says that Timothy, his father was a Greek, but his mother was a Jew. So he wasn't circumcised. So as to not give offense to the Jews, he circumcised Timothy. But in Galatians chapter 2, the verses we didn't read, 1 through 9, Titus who is, with, who is a Greek, wasn't circumcised. And it actually says right here why, verse 3, but not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. He wasn't compelled to be circumcised, so what gives? Why Timothy circumcised? Why not Titus? They're both Greeks. One of them is a full Greek, the other one's half Greek, half Jew. And what gives is, for the sake of the gospel, Timothy was circumcised. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 22 to 23, he says that I have become all things to all men so that I might save some, right? So that I might save some. And I do it for the sake of the gospel. And so what was at stake with Timothy was not justification by faith by obeying the law of Torah, but rather becoming all things to all men to not give offense to them. It would be similar to you going to the Middle East to a Muslim country and wearing a head covering as to not give offense because no one's going to listen to you if you're not at least willing to concede to their cultural norms that do not conflict with the gospel. It would be another thing for someone in America to tell me, you cannot tell me, you, you cannot preach the gospel unless you wear a head covering because we all have to wear the head covering. That's the part of how we are keeping God's law. So, so that, would be going, that would be going too far, taking it rather than a cultural norm and putting it into my works in order to be justified. And so that's what was at stake with Timothy. Timothy was there to not cause offense. 
But in Titus, Titus, they were telling him, you're a Greek. You got to become like a Jew. You must be circumcised. And Paul says, not one second will they give into it. It says they didn't give into him for an hour. They would have none of it. If you say, I need to become circumcised to be a good Jew in order to be saved, then I'll be worthy of, worthy of being saved. I will not participate in it at all because salvation is by grace alone through faith. As we will now get into it. Verse 15. So from verse 15 to 21, this is Paul's speech to them in Antioch that he publicly he publicly argues, to, argues specifically with Peter in response to Peter as the leader and the one who is leading those astray. But he says it to everyone in the church in Antioch. And this is going to be verses 15 to 16 will be justification defined. Verses 19 to 20 will be justification applied. And then we'll have some closing comments on verse 21. So verse 15 Paul starts out, I think it's important to understand this. Paul starts out with his opponent's argument. This is not Paul's argument. When he says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles, he's like, that's what the circumcision party is saying. They're saying, we're Jews by nature. We have the law, man. We got it all. We have, we have the promises of God have been given to us. We are children of Abraham. Like, we're not sinners like these dogs, these Gentiles who do not have the law, do not know God, are not part, part of the, the chosen nation of Israel. They didn't get, receive the law on Mount Sinai. They don't have their father as an Abraham. They weren't led through the Red Sea and set free. They weren't giving, so they don't have all this. We're God's people. So this is the opponent's argument is we are Jews by nature, natural descent, not brought in through adoption, not some other... Some, some other means of getting sneaking into the nation of Israel and being a proselyte, but we are the original Jews. And this is how Paul starts his argument, not sinners from among the Gentiles. So as far as sinners are concerned, what's in view here is sinners would be like, you guys are people who don't have the law and you don't keep the law. Right? Because you don't have law and you don't keep the law, you're sinners. And that's, how the, that's how the Jews are viewing the Gentiles because they do not have the law. And then Paul says this in verse 16, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by works of the law no flesh will be justified. You see here we kind of have like this justification sandwich as we're defining it. We have, by works of the law, no one will be justified. And then underneath the bottom bun is, by works of the law, no flesh will be justified. And then right in between, we have the meat, which is the gospel. It is, but through faith in Christ Jesus. That's how we will be justified, so that we may be justified by faith. So what we have in this verse is we have the law-gospel distinction. The law is incapable of saving anyone. It cannot save you. He's making it clear because he says, listen, we're Jews too. And he says right there, right in the middle, even we have believed. We Jews, we're the ones who are believing in this Christ. He, the law can't save us. Real fast, turn over to Hebrews chapter 7, please. Hebrews chapter 7, let me show you the futility of the law from God's own word. Hebrews chapter 7, this is about the priesthood of Christ. The priesthood of Christ and Christ coming as a priest, but Jesus Christ was not descended from the tribe of Levi, right? So legally, he couldn't be a priest. He can't be a priest legally because in the Old Testament, God told Moses, Levi will be a priest to me. They will not have an inheritance in the land. You guys are going to have to give them an offering. You guys set stuff apart for them. They, are, they don't get to get taxed, and they also, don't get, they also don't get land. What they do get is they are priests before me. They are the mediators between God's people and God. And then you have Jesus' priesthood. And Jesus is an interesting priest because he is actually descended from the tribe of Judah, which is very clear in Scripture, a descendant of David. He is not from Levi, but yet he's a priest. And this is kind of the context of what's going on here, explaining the priesthood of Jesus I want to pick up in verse 18, verses 18 to 25. This is what Hebrews 7 says. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside a former commandment because of its weakness 
and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Right here, in parentheses, if you're in your NASB Bible, it says, for the law made nothing perfect. It couldn't even, the most important thing, the mediator between God and man, the priesthood that God established, that law couldn't even make that connection perfect. They couldn't even have a right mediator between them because the law was incapable of making that mediator perfect. So the law, because it was useless in justifying man before God, it's set aside. That's what Hebrews says. He moves it aside and he brings in a better hope who is Christ. Christ is the one that, she, that God brings in so that he would justify those who believe in him. It was always justification by faith. It was always justification by faith. Even in the Old Testament, don't, be, don't, don't have this, this incorrect notion that they were under law, so they weren't under grace, and therefore they had to be, have obedience in order to be right with God. It was always by faith. Do you not know what the scriptures say? It says that Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. As we just read in Genesis 15, as you read in in the New Testament, looking back on that, his faith is credited to him as righteousness, believing in him, not his works, not his obedience, rather believing the promise of God. By works of the law, no one will be justified. And the reason is because the law, it does not have power to save. Because this is what the law does. The law only has the ability to show you your error, to show you your wrong. This is how you don't measure up. Oh, you lie? You're a liar. You've cheated? You cheated. It gives you no remedy. It only shows you your sin. So what the law does is it buries you deeper and deeper and deeper into hopelessness. That's what the law does. It will not perfect you. But Christ, in his justification and his work, he is the one who is able to actually uphold the law perfectly, which is the good news. This is where the gospel is so beautiful, is that Jesus says, I see that law. I obey it all perfectly. Everything, all the precepts of God, I perfectly keep it all. And then I die for you. I die in your place. I die paying the penalty. And so he does that on our behalf so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God, to quote a later text. So here's this law gospel distinction. The law, Paul is just making it so incredibly clear. It would almost, it, this, is why, this is why they get stoned a lot when they go and preach in Jerusalem and other Jewish populated areas, because he says things like this. Like the law, no one can be justified by works of the law. And every good Jew would say, are you crazy? How else can you be justified? If not through the sacrificial system, keeping kosher, doing the Sabbaths, doing all of the different things that we are demanded to do by the law of God. It's because the law has no power within itself to save. It never did. It was never its purpose. The law was always there to point us to our great need for redemption, which was the promised Messiah, who is Christ. And then we have these two little confusing verses here, verse 17, 18. So Paul is establishing this law gospel distinction, 15, 16. And then verses 17 and 18, he says, verse 17, but if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. So Paul is here talking about the Jews. The Jews are saying, okay, listen, we are, we are the ones who have the law. 
And so now we're just trying to be good Jews, which is what we know, which is you keep the law because this is what we've been catechized our entire lives. We obey God's law. So we go and we do this, and now we're just going to add Jesus to it, right? Like, doesn't that make sense? I'll just add Jesus to my law keeping. And then when I'm doing that, I'm adding Jesus to my law keeping. And then lo and behold, I find out that I am a sinner too. And it's because they, rather than, rather than humbly seeing that they were sinners all along, they think because they had the law, it set them apart as not being sinners. They had a huge error in their theology and thinking just because I had received the law of God, it set me apart already covenantally where I am not in the category of sinner. And so because I'm not in the category of sinner, I can just add Jesus to it. But then Paul proves to them, actually the law already exposed that you were always a sinner. And now you're saying, oh, well, I, now I have Jesus. So then is Jesus, Jesus is the one who made me a sinner? It's like, no, that's what the law did. That's what he's saying. That's what the law did. The law showed you you were a sinner. I'm just helping you expose that because they're having, they're having a really hard time going from keeping the law to justification by faith alone. And then the next one, verse 18, he says, For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. And what Paul is basically saying in another argument is, okay, I'm going to, I got, I'm justified in faith. I got that. We're good. And now... I'm going to go ahead and slip back into works righteousness. Now, how do I continue this relationship with this one God after I've been justified? Well, I have to do it by law keeping. And this is how I am kept right with him. Rather than you are always in right standing with God through faith in his son, not by rebuilding this whole legalistic work system and trying to appease God somehow as if he wasn't fully appeased in his son on the cross. And so this is what these... These two verses kind of slapped right there in the middle are going on. And now we have arrived at our text, verses 19 and 20. Verses 19 and 20, we have four theses that Paul gives us. The first one is in verse 19. The second, verse 20a. Third, verse 20b. And fourth, verse 20c. And these four theses is how Paul articulates the gospel of justification by faith and what it looks like. This is justification applied. Now that I've told you the law cannot save you, I've defined justification is the free, sovereign act of God to make right a sinful people by the death of his one and only son on the cross for our sins. So this is how you are made right. And now how does that, what does that mean to me then? How does that affect me? And this is the first thing that Paul says in verse 19. He says, For through the law I die to the law so that I might live to God. I want you to flip back a couple of pages to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 is an extremely helpful cross reference for understanding verses 19 and 20. Uh, most commentators would say that 19 and 20, verse 19 and 20, are actually, they are a summary form of what is clearly explained in Romans chapter 6. So if you want to understand Galatians 2, 19 and 20, you've got to understand Romans chapter 6. So I want to look at Romans chapter 6 real fast. We're going to look at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Romans 6, 1 through 3. And this is our verse in, in Galatians. He says, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. Here's what he's saying here. Verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? So what is going on here? We have died to the law so that I might live to God. So in our union with Christ, and union with Christ simply means to be to have faith with Jesus and you are brought into a saving covenantal relationship with Jesus as Savior. And in that, in his death, as Paul articulates here in, in Romans chapter 6, when we are baptized into his death, we actually participate in the penalty for the sin of disobeying God's law. Okay, so think of it this way. We have 
Jesus who lives a perfect life, but he dies the death that we should have died, right? It's a great exchange. And so the death that he dies is he pays the penalty for all the sins, all the law breaking, the full weight of the law breaking. That penalty is put on him, but it's ours. And we participate in that death and baptism, as Paul says in Romans 6. So when you die, you are condemned by the law. That is just and righteous and good. It is good that God condemns you for breaking his law because he is holy and perfect. And by no means will he clear the guilty. So we participate in that death. So the penalty for the law, which is death, we participate in that in baptism, as Paul says in Romans 6, right? So all of the condemnation that the law could ever have over our heads, we participate in the death of Christ in baptism. And so what does that mean? That means that the law no longer has any condemnation or ability to condemn me. Because I would say law. You say, yes, I'm a lawbreaker. I said, yes, that's right. And my Savior, he died for that. You can't condemn me anymore. Now, that does not mean that I put aside the law and then I just live as a lawbreaker and a rampant sinner so that grace may abound, as Romans 6 says. So should we continue sinning so that grace may abound? He says, by no means. Like You're missing it. You're missing the point. If you think you could just go live like the devil and act like you're a Christian because justification by faith, man. So like it's all good. Absolutely not. But what it does mean is, it means Romans chapter 8. It means there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what it means. That the law has no ability to condemn the Christian. Because the con- Christian says, law, you're right. You're right to condemn me for my sin. But the problem is, I already died to your penalty in Christ, in union with Christ on that cross. So then, 19, for through the law, I died to the law. It was the just penalty for our sin that we would die in the law. So that, and now, I might live to God. So now the Christian, that's exactly the point. That's what Romans 6 says, that we don't continue in sin, so that grace may abound, but rather we get to now live our life out to the glory of God. We get to do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. You get to do that now, Christian, because you have died. You have, through the law, you died to the law, so now you may live to God. His second thesis, this is verse 20, uh, 20a. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. So I want to just kind of cross-reference this over Galatians chapter 3, 26 to 28. Galatians 3, 26 to 28. On this crucifixion with Christ, this being unified, joined together with him in baptism and the crucifixion. Uh, 26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So in this great crucifixion with our Savior, in this being able to participate in it through baptism, and so I won't get into it, whether it's water baptism or spirit, Holy Spirit baptism, but through the means of baptism, we actually participate in the crucifixion of Christ. So you can already say in Christ that I, I have already, the, 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 the penalty of the law is past tense for me because I participated with Christ in baptism in his crucifixion and he paid the penalty. So there remains no penalty for the law breaking for you, Christian, who is in Christ. This is what it means to participate, to be crucified with him, is that the law no longer has any ability to condemn you because the law already condemned Christ fully. And God is a just judge. He will not hold you accountable for that which he already paid the penalty in his son. He doesn't do double jeopardy. He's not going to get you and get his son because his son's sacrifice wasn't sufficient for you, but rather because our Savior died a perfect and complete death, we know that we, all of our sins have been fully paid for in Christ. So there is rest for the Christian. 
And verse, excuse me, in uh, our third thesis, uh, 20b, it says, And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Okay, the I, this I who live. This is, we're going to go back to this I, Paul. Paul is using himself as an example of what happens to all believers in believing in Christ for their justification, is that this I that he is talking about, this is his sinful past. This is the I which represents the sinful man who is born, Ephesians 2, born dead in his trespasses and sins in which we once all walked following the course of this world. You know, the children of, who are now at work and the sons of disobedience, like this, this, that's the I he's talking about. This I who is dead in sin before Christ. He said, that I is no longer active in my life. And so we, we won't get into Romans 7 because I know there's a war of the flesh still. But we're talking theologically first here, justification. And here, that I is dead. And now Christ is the one who lives in me. What a beautiful truth that the Christian has the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God abiding within us because of our union with Christ, our being connected to him in faith. I want to turn over to Galatians 5.24 for a cross-reference on this, on this passage here, on this thesis, this uh, third thesis we're looking at. 524 says this, Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Right? This is kind of, this is after the fact. This is now, we're talking here about sanctification. What Paul's talking about here is justification. The Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. Now he, he abides within me. I abide in him. This is what happens at justification. You are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And now that you have that, now, and we get to Galatians 5, and obviously the fruit of the Spirit, as we are looking at, this is where this passage is found, is that we get to crucify the flesh with its sinful desires. And we get to live to God now. We get to, we get to do that because it is Christ who abides in us. So dear Christian, don't make the mistake of thinking all your righteous deeds come from you. Rather, they come from Christ who abides in you and he is producing his fruit in you. As we know, they are called the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his own good pleasure. Philippians 2.12. The fourth thesis here, he says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So a lot of these verses, when you're working through them, it seems like Paul just said the same thing. He just like kind of changed one word. He's like, what gives? You're just repeating yourself over and over and over again. He does repeat himself, and it is good because we are quick to forget. So it's good that he repeats himself. But he's actually getting at something really particular here. The life which I now live in the flesh, right? So he is making the point that, listen, brothers and sisters, the Christian life is a life to actually be lived. You actually have to go do things. It's not just this intellectual ascent that you make in your mind that, oh yes, I believe Jesus, son of God, three days, holy virgin birth, all those things. You're, you wanna, it's not just about believing facts. That's not good enough. Um, excuse me. It's not just about believing facts and it has no effect on your life because it does have effect in your life, in the flesh. This is where you actually do your good works. Ephesians 2.10, he has predestined good works that we might walk in them. This is after justification, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we have been justified by grace through faith. It's not, a, not of your own doing, so that no one man may boast. It is the gift of God. And then he predestines good works that we would walk in them, which is exactly what Paul is saying here in summary and condensed form. The life which we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God. And Paul can't help himself. He has to say, because it is God, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So where, do your, where, does, the, where does the energy for your good works flow from? It doesn't flow from, I just got to do better. I just got to work harder. I just got to get myself together. I got to pull myself up by my bootstraps. It's no. It comes from love. It comes from a particular love for a particular individual. 
And this is what it means to be in Christ, is that Christ, yes, he died for his bride. He has all one bride. We are corporately his bride. But the bride is made up of individual people. And those individual people have this exact experience, what Paul is talking about here, that Christ loved me individually. Me, Armando, sinful man, broken, hopeless, without God in the world, unable to save myself, unable to fix broken relationships, unable to heal hurting family members, unable to heal sick children. This man, he died for me. He gave himself up for me because he loved me. When I grab a hold, when I can finally get a hold of the truth that God loves me in his son, that he died for me as his beloved, then I can work. I can work out of that love. That is working. That is exactly actually what the preamble to the Ten Commandments is talking about. It says, Israel, I am your God who brought you out of the land of Israel, uh, land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. And then he goes through the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, the preamble is redemption. You have been justified. I have redeemed you. I have saved you. Now go walk this way. This is what we have here. He does love us. He did give himself up for us. Now go live this way. Because it is done, we get to go and do things. We get to work, which is why we have the, back in the day, I don't know about anymore, but there was this thing called the Puritan work ethic. He said these, these Puritans, they just worked so hard. They were so diligent. Is because they did all their work as unto the glory of the Lord because they knew they weren't working for their salvation. They had nothing to earn. It was already purchased. It's free. Free grace makes hard workers. Give me some more of those guys, you know? This is what we have, dear believer. This is what we have, saint. We have free grace. Do not go back to law. Law will only enslave you. Come to Christ by grace, through faith, the merits of Christ alone. And then Paul, just to defend himself in verse 21, says, I'm not nullifying the grace of God, meaning the grace of God, meaning all the work of salvation. I'm not putting that aside and acting like, oh, because we don't keep the law, therefore God is not gracious. He's saying, no, I'm not doing that. That's not what I'm doing. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is showing you the grace of God. It's doing the very opposite. I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness or if justification comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. If you could actually be justified before God by keeping the law, then yes, Christ died for no reason, but because it can't, because it can only condemn you. That's why Christ needed to die, and he did. And as it says in verse 20, he did it because he loved you, because he gave himself up for you. But remember this, dear saint, he only did this for his children. He only did those for who, those who believe upon the name of Christ. Jesus' justification is particular. It is for his people alone. We come to him in faith. We come to him believing that what he has done in his son is true and is sufficient because his word declares it. And we can only do that because he grants to us that faith to trust him. The, the grace that he gives is free. The, the faith that he gives is free. Let us come to him. Let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, we thank you for your word, Father, that is living and active. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who came to save us from our sin and our rebellion. He has justified us through his perfect death on the cross, a death that we deserved, and you have poured it all out on your son for those who believe in him and who have been called according to his purpose. I pray, Father, that these truths would not just rest in our minds, but would get down into our hearts and leak out into our fingers and hands and feet as we work and love and do good to others in our community, in our homes, 
and wherever we may be, that we would be about our Father's work, walking in step with the truth of the gospel. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.